finally, 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 insert your expletive here. It is draft week. Hallelujah, Eddie Garrison. We are here. Kevin Bowen, Eddie Garrison, back. Another edition of Kevin's Corner. It is Monday, April 24th, and come Thursday night, the Colts will be picking fourth overall. I should say probably entering the night at fourth overall. We'll see how it plays out. And You know, I, I know I said this a little bit on last week's pod, Eddie, but I just think this should be viewed more than anything. It should be viewed as a really an exciting week. Really an exciting week. Um, selfishly, I'm glad that we can finally talk about real humans associated with the Colts. But what fake humans? We have those. Well, maybe you know, imaginary humans. Um, it's not the biggest step in the world, but it will be a step, in my opinion, down the correct path. Now, there's going to be a lot of things that you encounter on that path of is it the right guy how much you support him dealing with fame etc cetera, etc cetera. but again more than anything eddie i think for the first time since the retirement of andrew luck you have made an attempt to try and create a winner for the next five to ten years mm-hmm. um, people can push back and say maybe carson Wentz was that but Having one in your own building, having one that you've identified in the draft, having one on a rookie deal, I think is a lot different. Having one that, you know, you're not giving up the capital nor assuming the the money that that, that Carson Wentz did. Um, I, I I it's not Tyrese Halliburton trade like Halliburton mm-hmm. proven it for a year and a half. It's difficult to do that in the NFL, but it is a step down the right path. So my overwhelming feeling about this is Colts fans should have intrigue and hope. And a little bit of injection of life. And I think that's really, really needed right now. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, and there's Colts fans out there that will criticize any of the quarterbacks they select. I mean, rightfully so. All these guys have question marks, but all of these guys have promising upsides too. Um, Considering head coach uh, Shane Steichen, his ability to hopefully get the best out of that quarterback and be able to groom that quarterback into the system he wants um, and then put the Colts in a position to get back into the playoffs and competing again for an AFC South title. For all those reasons, Eddie, um, this is an exciting week for me. Um, And I think, again, for Colts fans as well. Today's pod, we will reveal my mock. It's going to post to the website on Tuesday, so you guys are getting this a little bit earlier than everybody else. Uh, I do want to begin, before we get to Twitter questions as well, just right off the bat with some Chris Ballard comments from, from Friday. You know, I think I talked about this before. You know, to me, the the Ballard pre-draft presser is not like the end of the war. Like, it's not like, oh, he's just going to lie there for 20 minutes. You can get, I think, a lot of insight out of him, you know, non, hey, who are you going to pick related. And then some of the comments, you just got to kind of have to sift through yourself, whether you believe them or you don't. Um, so, Eddie, feel free to chime in on anything Ballard said that, that you wanted to to discuss. Mm-hmm. You know, he mentioned at picks one, two, or three, he has no idea how it's going to unfold. Um, I thought Peter King had some really interesting comments today in his Monday morning quarterback that kind of backed that up. There was a GM that mentioned that last year at this time, he felt 90% confident in you know what the selection would look like or, or, or how it would play out. Um, and now that GM feels about 25% confident. Uh, if you look at the 11 teams... The first 11 teams in the draft, I want to say it's 9 of the 11 have either a different head coach or a different GM. So obviously you have now new philosophies, different philosophies for all of those teams drafting high. Just look at the top four. You know, Each of the first four teams have new head coaches in in Carolina and Houston and Arizona and then Indy as well. So for a lot of reasons, I think there's an unpredictability to this. Um, I thought Ballard said something interesting, makes sense, and I agree with. And that Shane Steichen's kind of broadened the field at quarterback. Okay, oh, you can do that with him. Oh, you know, you can kind of I, – I, I was not necessarily thinking that. Um, I do think that is another reason to have hope and belief in Shane Steichen. Um, it's a big reason why, I, again, I believe in Shane Steichen with quarterback as well. And then I want to bring up what I thought was just the most interesting draft-related comment in the presser and again insert your everyone is lying Ballard chose to use the word dancing instead of lying smokescreen season all of that Eddie but we're about 10 minutes into the presser the question was I want to say it was like something to do with 
do you monitor teams behind you trading up for, you know, ahead of you? And very unprompted, midway through the answer, Ballard said something to the effect of like, you know, everyone thinks we've targeted one guy. That's the assumption. But that assumption is not true. I thought the answer was, made me pause, made me kind of freeze for a couple questions and think, wow, what what was he trying to do there? Mm -hmm. You can look at that so many ways, Eddie. You can look at that and say, Ballard's being honest. And come late Thursday night, early Friday morning, he's going to sit there at that same press conference uh, table and say, I told you guys last week that everyone thought we had one guy pegged. And we didn't. And I assume that one guy he met, Will Levis. I Mm -hmm. guess I should preface that. I mean, maybe he didn't. But I feel like as of Friday, Eddie, the popular thought, maybe more nationally, certainly there are people in this local market that, that, that think the Colts and Will Levis will be the pick. But I think nationally, it was starting to build that Will Levis to the Colts. Now, if you look in Vegas right now, you got Will Levis going number two. So, you know, which is just another kind of crazy wrinkle to it all. Um, so now my mind starts racing. It was the only time he really mentioned that throughout the the press conference. Mm-hmm. You would think if he was trying to lie or if he was trying to downplay the situation, he would have mentioned it like a handful of times. And then all of a sudden, you know, he would have looked at us and been like, oh, I was doing some dancing a week ago. But if Ballard has had a track record of doing anything in these press conference settings, he usually throws in one little nugget like that. And then you look back on it, and you're like, well, he did tell us. Mm -hmm. Now, again, quarterback's totally different, and it is line season. It is smokescreen season. But I just found that particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, And I guess, again, when I have heard about Levis, so much of it has been before the Steichen hire. Um, There's people I trust that have said Levis. There's people I trust that have said Richardson. So I, I don't have a great feel one way or the other. But I did think that was maybe the most hmm moment for me during the press conference. Yeah, I agree. Probably when when you pointed that out uh, on Friday when we talked. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Uh, one av- one avenue I want to go down and and I'm in the same belief in you in this regard. When Ballard said that they had 17 players with the first round grade, a lot of fans were like, "Oh no, this is going to be why." You know, he trades back, recoups some picks because. You know, he only views that there are 17 players worth a first round price tag. But you and I both have the feeling that this could be a good thing for Colts fans and something that Ballard doesn't typically do. Yeah, I, I it's very unusual, would be very unusual. For him to trade back up is what Correct. I was hinting at there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very unusual. And, and you know, again, 17 first round grades. How I kind of look at that is this, Eddie. I don't feel like this roster has enough high-end talent at the positions that matter. We, you know, we, we've heard about roster depth ad nauseum for the last seven years. That's fine and well, but I think when you see some playoff teams that have success, you can usually point to, you know, four to six guys again at positions that really matter as the true separators. And how I would view Thursday night is this, Eddie. You know, again, if you have seventeen guys as first-round grades. And if several of them fall at positions that really matter, and you get to 25 or you get to 26, and let's say one of those positions is a wideout, and all of a sudden that guy's still on the board, and if he's still on the board at 28, if he's still on the board at 29, I think you got to think about this financially as well. Not only do, do, do I think the receiver room needs a little bit of injection of kind of that, that point guard to complement the power forwards you have in that room, but let's think back to what happened last offseason. This time last year, Eddie, what happened? You had great second and third round wideouts from the 2019 draft cash in early. Jalen Hurts, he just cashed in early because he is in a second rounder, mm-hmm. four year contract. Justin Herbert's going to wait. Joe Burrow's going to wait because you get the fifth year team option on you for the first round picks. So in DK Metcalf's case, in Terry McLaurin's case, in Debo Samuel's case, We'll wait on A.J. Brown for a second. They all were able to cash in early because they were great players on four-year deals. Obviously, A.J. Brown, it got to the point where Tennessee thought it was too rich. So, boom. 
here comes Philly, and they make that trade um, right before the draft. That's where I look at it and think, if you have a wideout that you love, not only is it worth just taking them, because frankly, you just need to pair the young quarterback with a young wideout, in my opinion, but also, if you want to look a little bit down the road, it can make some sense financially. Now, is it going to complicate things when you're paying a quarterback and you're paying a wideout, you know, potentially in the same offseason? Sure, but you're going to find a way. You know, you were finding a way to pay Andrew Luck and T.Y. Hilton pretty good money when you did that. So you can make that happen. But that would be something I would highly entertain. Now, again, this is Kevin Bowen's hat on, not Chris Ballard's hat on. I could totally see Ballard turning 35 into pick 43 and 74, you know, something along those lines. But that is something, if the board falls in a way that makes sense for you, I would do it. You need more top end talent, man. You need more of it. What about tight end? Because he didn't he did throw in there. I don't know if it was with you guys in the media or if this was with Matt Taylor and uh, JJ Stankovitz interview they did. He mentioned tight end as a really deep class. Yeah. yeah. Joel Joel Erickson and I were able to kind of throw in some some draft depth positional need questions kind of late in the presser, which you know, I always find that beneficial with Balor. I think you know, so many people are like, oh, he's not going to say anything today. I'm like, no, he's going to be honest with us about you know positions that matter. He gushes about the tight end group. Um, I will never turn down a pass catcher. I will never turn down an edge rusher. I'll almost always never turn down a pass catcher. I do think if I'm going to nitpick Eddie, I'd rather see a wide out than a tight end, though. Agreed. And I know that doesn't match the draft depth, but I'm glad you brought that up, tight end. You know, I thought Jelani Woods had some moments late in the year. Certainly a 180 from how he looked in camp. I would have liked to have seen him, frankly, get the ball a little bit more mm-hmm. late in the year. Um, but, you know, how do you look at Ogletree coming off the ACL? What do you think about Kylan Granson as he kind of reaches that back end of the rookie contract? Mo Alley Cox at this point, to me, I don't think you can kind of bank on as a number one. I mean, he, he's just not that. So um, I'm not going to cross tight end off the board. You know, he mentioned O line and corner as positions he could double dip draft and free agency still. There are still names in both of those position groups Mm -hmm. in free agency. I didn't like the add depth to the O-line. I would like to add some starting competition Mm -hmm. to the O-line. I don't think Will Fry should have his name in Sharpie at right guard. That's my thought. The other position he mentioned is defensive end, particularly edge. Uh He pointed that out. It does seem like when you talk to kind of Draft people, and obviously we've played the interviews for you guys. In some order, corner, tight end, and edge are three positions of depth in this class. So, you know, when we did the positional mock last week, Eddie, I think I said to you, I'm kind of beating myself up of like not having an edge on here. You Mm -hmm. can just purely off of what you have on your roster right now, I think you can get by. But that's another position I look at and be like, do you just have guys there? You know, could you, is Quiddy Pay? Going to make this third year jump to where, boom, he's a double digit dozen sack guy for you the last three or four years. I find it amazing. And I guess I just kind of forget this. You know, Cody Pay's the only first round pick the Colts have made since Quentin Nelson. Yeah. Because you have the Buckner trade. The Buckner in 2019. Yeah. Um, 2020 was, you traded out of round one. Montez Sweat was there for you. You traded yeah. out of one and you took. Rock, right? Rock yep. you've seen early in the second. The next year was Quiddy. Uh, and then the year after that, you obviously didn't have your first rounder because of the Carson trade. Yeah. It, it just, it's something that, like, obviously is fact, but I just kind of forgot that. And also, Chris Boward has had 12 second round picks in his tenure. Easily the most. Yeah. Of, of any round. Those are just some little, you know, random factoids. Factoids here. Um, also, when you look at the last. Six number four overall picks, Eddie. Not quarterback. None of them quarterback. Sauce Gardner, Kyle Pitts, Andrew Thomas, Cleveland Farrell, Denzel Ward, Leonard Fournette. One bust in there. Farrell a bust. Fournette don't take running backs that high. Ward couple Pro Bowls. Andrew Thomas starting to really come on. Uh, Kyle Pitts get him a QB. Sauce Gardner very good at football. <laughs> Hashtag analysis. Right? Yeah, thank you for that. Hashtag analysis on that. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I'm off on a tangent now. All good. But draft depth, getting back to it. Um, tight end will be 
That'll be one to watch. I think, you know, I asked Joel this question. We, we had him on our morning show today. You know, what's a position that'll make you kind of go, huh? You know, whoa. If they draft a linebacker on Friday night, that would make me say, whoa, what do you know about Shaquille Leonard? I thought you had linebacker as a positional mock draft selection, I too. Five. I had it in five, not in three. To me, that's a big difference. Oh, you has. I was in the third. That would be a woe for you? That'd be a woe. Yeah, okay. Friday night. So round two and round three. You know, I think we think or we assume quarterback is one. Mm-hmm. So then you go to Friday night. You've got 35 and what is it, 79, I want to say. Mm-hmm. What would be the position they would take on Friday night that you would say, huh? Like what? Uh, obviously running back would be one. To me, linebacker would be on the list. Not because, again, linebacker is a need. Yep, but to me, it's not that early. I think you rely on Ballard's history there at that position. I know it's not a great linebacker draft class, so you know, do you get like in a scarcity thing of like, hey, it really falls on this? Seems a bit rich for me. Some people have said safety. You know, you've drafted a lot of safeties. You know, obviously Cross last year in round Mm -hmm. three, Blackman a few years ago. Uh, Any position on Friday night, Eddie? Before we get into the mock draft or anything else Ballard related? Um. Not really. I mean, linebacker could be a little bit of a head scratcher, but to me, if I'm a Colts fan and Ballard's drafting a linebacker in, let's say, round three, then I would have some serious optimism about this guy being like an absolute steal in the draft because of his knack of drafting linebackers. It's a good way to look at it. Certainly a good way to look at it. Um, and I probably fall on the how important is linebacker. And I, boy, I. I I really like EJ Speed. So I do too. Um, anything else from Ballard on Friday? Um, I've got a notebook up on our website if you guys missed that. Just a few more takeaways in there on that end. But anything else before we get into my mock? I don't have anything else. All right, Eddie. Here we go. Rip, rip away. Rip as you would like. With the fourth overall pick <laughs> in the 2023 NFL Draft, the Indianapolis Colts select. You know, it's funny how less confident I am about this choice in a public setting than I was about Michael Pittman at number 34 overall a few years ago. <laughs> and last year we got position right. We didn't get player right. I had Sky Moore, uh, not Alec Pierce. Um, I, I, I don't have great, great conviction. Um, and I've actually made a late change on this from where I was at. Uh, I don't love going against the popular, basically what I think is the most consistent on-field similarity that both Ballard and Steichen have shared, to me, is accuracy. And I'm kind of going against that with this selection. I think you can look back, though, with Ballard, with Steichen, hell, with even Ursay, and you can make of it, you can make it sound supportive of your draft pick whether you want levis whether you want richardson i should say into this scenario eddie i have will anderson cj stroud and bryce young off the board okay so I, I should probably start there so that means anthony richardson will levis you know tyree wilson hidden hooker whoever else you want to throw on there both on the board i i will i will go with anthony richardson um you know, Steichen developing those raw traits is probably where I'm at a little bit. Um, to me, I, I've heard a little bit more Richardson than Levis. Again, it's not overwhelming. I'm not taking this to the bank. I'm certainly not putting the 529s of the Bowen household on any of this sort of thought process. But if you're going to make me pick, this is where I'm at. I will say Anthony Richardson at number four. Interesting. Interesting. And I literally, when they announce Levis, I'm going to be like, you're such an idiot because I've talked about that accuracy trait throughout. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Maybe I'm now banking off of, you know, Steichen is saying you can develop a little bit of accuracy. And there were a lot of drops at Florida and, you know, this and that. And he's going to sit for a year behind Minch. I don't know what the hell I'm thinking, to be honest with you. But here we are. Do you sit in the belief? I can't remember who said this. But um, they said that Levis seems like the best route over Richardson because of the veteran roster 
that the Colts have that's closer to a win now. I'd highly disagree with that. I'd just highly disagree with it. Um, I forget who said that. You know, no matter what you do, Eddie, you're going to have to draft well. I mean, I brought up the Grigson drafts last podcast. You're going to have to... 2024 and 2025 and 2026, you're going to have to find new guys. When Peyton Manning was drafted in 98, no Edron James, no Reggie Wayne, no Robert Mathis, no Dwight Freeney, no Dallas Clark. Yep. Were those people important to that era having great success? Not at all. So <laughs> you're going to have to continue to support. Um, and maybe I'm falling a little bit into this trap, Eddie. And maybe it's something that, you, that you've brought up. Because correct me if I'm wrong, you, you love Stroud, uh huh. But I think Richardson is somewhat intriguing to you. Yes. There is a group out there that has said, "Look at the AFC right now. You want to get swallowed up in the middle of it, or do you want to try and get to the top of it?" Great quarterbacks, young quarterbacks, should mm-hmm. you swing for the fences with a grand slam type swing, and not just a "Hey, let's get a two-run double off the wall." You know, would Levis get you to the top? Would Richardson get you the top? Richardson's more boomer bust. Hey, you know that's how some some people look at it. I again on a Friday podcast this week, I am not going to bemoan a Levis or Richardson. Like you've made the selection, mm-hmm. you're going to have to develop the raw traits. You're going to have to try and get the issues to a f- capable, competent level. And then you're going to have to support the dude like hell. So, with that, let's move to Friday. One slight comment I want to make here, and just from on my end. Yeah. Um, I think there's going to be out, they're going to have to do a really, really good job at managing expectations because I think if the Colts went the Levis route, fans would not be calling for his name to be starting week one. If they went the Anthony Richardson route, because there are a lot of diehard Anthony Richardson to the Colts uh, believers out there, they're going to want him in there day one because of his legs and his mobility and his athleticism and his just freak of nature talent. So if they went the Richardson route, they would have to do a lot of um, management of expectations, and that's something they haven't done well lately. Yeah, and that will be a big-time May storyline, and... The debate on when you hand the keys to that guy is a great one. It is is a great one. So, um, all right, let's go Richardson, and then let's let's move on. In the second round at 35 overall, last week you said the Colts would go cornerback, but in your mock draft, do you have them going wide receiver? I do. Uh-huh, I do. And I have them tapping into the program that obviously fed them one last year. I'm going to go Tyler Scott, Cincinnati. Um, I like the background. I like the big playability. He certainly is not the body type that Chris Bauer typically drafts at wide out. How I view it, Eddie, is, again, you need some point guard in that room with power forwards. You know, I saw Warren Sharp put the notes out over the weekend. I think the Colts were 29th in the NFL in plays of 20 yards or more last year. Yep. You, you, you just have got to create some big playability. Tyler Scott had eight of them of over 20 yards last season, or I think it might have been even 30 yards last season. You know, there are some kind of – Hilton type body type speed with that. So that probably falls into it a little bit. We know Ballard has thought very highly of Cincinnati and Luke Fickle. Of course, Fickle's moved on, but it was certainly a big part of uh, Tyler Scott and all of that. So that's where I'm going to go, going to go here. I'm going to go with a um, smaller, quicker wide out to complement what you have. Um, in an ideal world, you'd have this pairing for quite some time. That, that would be would, the most ideal thing. That would be the goal that you're going with here. So I'll go wide out at 35. So from last week's positional mock draft, you had wide receiver in round three, corner in round two. You flipped them in your mock. On round three, pick 79, you have them uh, going with the cornerback from a familiar program. Yeah, we are. We are going back to a program and a position group that has given the Colts something. That would be Utah and, and Clark Phillips. The body type to me, Eddie, is a little – Different, you know, at corner, I think slot is still a need. You know, I, I know that position, a little bit of scrutiny and just kind of a little bit of uncertainty. Maybe last year with with how it was utilized slash how Kenny Moore played it. I look at Clark Phillips and think this is a guy that could be your next Kenny Moore. 
He's got a he got his hands on a ton of balls at Utah. Thirty passes defensed in his career. I think nine interceptions. A couple of those return for a touchdown. We're talking a captain. Those are all key things for Chris Ballard, particularly getting your you know hands on some balls and, and doing something with them. You know, Ballard. We saw it last year. This is a team that just kind of lacked instincts for that, especially when it wasn't Gilmore making those plays and you didn't have Leonard. So, I will go with Clark Phillips. You know, part of me, and you obviously will see this with the next pick, there is a slight deviation that I've had. And by the way, I did one of those like mock simulators to try and see what was on the board. Not so I was just like plucking from, <laughs> you know, just random. I, I wanted to make it as somewhat accurate as I could here. There will be a slight deviation from supporting that quarterback. I still think, in a way, this is supporting you moving forward. These are premium positions to me. And, and I'm trying to focus. On that, I mean, we're still going to get in some offensive picks, uh, but to me, at corner, it's just so void right now. And trying to help out your pass rush and trying to help out your overall football team, I still look at corner as something that you need to tap into. It is something that they need to tap into, and you have them tapping into it twice in consecutive rounds. Round four, pick 106, you have them going cornerback again with a local product. Let's drive up 65, man. We'll drive up 65, and we'll take Corey Trice. I mean, you talk about a frame. This is what Gus Bradley talks about. This is a little bit more what Bauer. And outside corner is definitely a need as well. Um, you know, He's got the uh, Richard Sherman yes. type of build. Yeah, I think Seattle. Very long arms. Sure, 6'3", 206. I mean, that's a big dude. Got his hand on a good amount of balls this past season at, at Purdue. You know, it was initially a safety and then moved over to, to corner. Yeah. Um, so I think what you're doing here is a little bit of short term, a little bit of long term, a little bit of outside, a little bit of inside with Corey Trice here. Um, and you need it. We've talked about Kenny Moore and Isaiah Rogers in uh, contract years. Not something that we probably put a whole lot of attention to. Maybe Kenny more so than Isaiah Rogers. But yeah, let's go Corey Trice here at 106. At 138 in round five, you have the Colts going back to the offensive side of the fo- uh, football and getting a tackle. Blake Freeland from BYU, Eddie. Um, I look at tackle as one play away from all of a sudden needing somebody big time. And it, I think at some point you need to start getting a little bit out of your day three picks on the O-line. I know that's a little greedy of me, but I think you need to, like even just give me a Joe Haig, you know, out of this sort of selection here. The thing I like about Freeland, um, 15 starts at right tackle, 26 at left. So, I mean, that's a lot of experience, at more than a year at, at each of those tackle spots. Um, you know, captain at BYU, pretty good athletic profile to go with the 6'7 frame. I mean, those are things that I think you are looking for and you like. So, um, I will go with tackle here as they begin a flurry of round five picks. That's a nice um, swing tackle option, too. Like, if you need, because of, I mean, if Bernard Ryman doesn't pan out and you just need to throw him in. To get a couple snaps here and there, if, whether that he's hurt or, you know, Ryman just needs to be benched for a couple of players or a series or something, then you have a guy who has experience on both sides. And if Braden Smith goes down, uh, I like that selection. Uh, this one is from Buffalo at 162. Uh, you go back to defense with linebacker. And uh, I think uh, he this particular player went viral on Twitter and social media for like a day because of uh, Robert Griffin III. Oh, I, I, I must have missed that. It's an orgy in the end zone. Okay, I, I I had a guess that it has something to do with the last name. Um, boy, that's a great line by Robert Robert Griffin the third there. Uh, Anthony Orgy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a selection here. You know, Clark Lee's the coach at Vandy. Came from Notre Dame, linebacker by trade, linebacker background. So I think anytime you got a head coach, and he's had a linebacker with the type of production that Orgy did at, at Vandy. It catches your eye. Um, he's their leading tackler each of the last three seasons, three-year starter at Vandy. Again, a little bit undersized, but really good testing numbers. A lot of special teams history to the NFL. And you play in the SEC. And, and if I can, I'm always trying to kind of dot things from an SEC standpoint. So in round five, Eddie, I think you got to check the linebacker box, and we're doing that here. And the final pick from round five is from Dallas. In the Stephon Gilmore trade at pick 176, you couldn't resist 
A Notre Dame offensive lineman. An ND offensive lineman in Jarrett Patterson. Uh, interior guy. He's played a little center. He's played a little guard. Um, it's over 30 starts at center. You know, thought extremely highly of when they were making the transition from Brian Kelly to Marcus Freeman. He stayed there and kind of their leader amidst all the quarterback turnover that they did have there. And, you know, it, to me, you can go a couple of ways with how you view kind of center in a young quarterback. I think part of it is, hey, get the veteran center to balance out the young quarterback, and obviously the Colts saw Ryan Kelly on the roster. But I think at some point, you also need to pass the torch to that young center. You know, With, with luck, it was such a revolving door. Mm-hmm. You never really found that guy. I think you'd like to find a little bit of Jeff Saturday to Peyton Manning. And so that's where this selection comes into play. Again, Patterson had some injuries. Um, there's a reason why he's not going to be, you know, probably called until somewhere on day three. But uh, I'll go a couple offensive line picks here in round five. And round seven, pick 221, you have the Indianapolis Colts taking their Naheem Hines replacement, a running back. Yes, Evan Hall out of Northwestern. Some really nice catch numbers at Northwestern for He's him. He's a really good runner. I wouldn't think of like Northwestern producing a pass-catching running back. But 55 catches this past year. I think he was over 30 the year before that. And if you remember in the positional mock, it was this kind of type of running back I want to see. You know, continue to make that room diverse, find a little compliment to Jonathan Taylor and Zach Moss. So that's what I'm going with here in round seven. Plus, I, I just like the Northwestern grit. I can tap into Pat Fitzgerald. I'm going to do it. Are you not a believer in Zach, uh, not Zach Moss, uh, Deion Jackson for that role? Just throw another body in there, you know? Throw another body in there. I thought when Naeem Hines was traded, the door was open for somebody to do something, and no one really did anything late in the year. This last pick in round seven, 236, comes from last year's trade with Tampa Bay, uh, where they got Grant Stewart, and you have them going safety con- to conclude the 2023 NFL draft. I am going to go with a Rutgers safety. Uh, Christian, I hope I'm saying this right, Isian? Does that sound right? Sure. We'll go with that. <laughs> uh, super undersized, big-time social teams background. Uh, did start 41 games at Rutgers, made some plays behind the line of scrimmage in his time. Again, this is more about, at this point, talk me into anything, Eddie. You know, I, I'm just throwing a dart at a board here for a special teams guy. And we'll see what happens with Rodney Thomas and Nick Cross and Julian Blackman and those guys moving forward, but that's where I'm going. A little bit of Big Ten flavor, a little bit of local flavor. Get a weapon, get a couple offensive linemen, get a couple corners. I feel like I've checked a decent amount of boxes here. Yep, just to recap, uh, round one, pick four, quarterback Anthony Richardson. Round two, pick 35, wide receiver Tyler Scott. Round three, from Washington, pick 79, cornerback Clark Phillips. Round four, pick 106, Corey Trice, cornerback. Round five, pick 138, offensive tackle Blake Freeland. Round five, pick 162 from Buffalo in the Naheem Hines trade, linebacker Anthony Orgy. Round five in the trade for Stephon, or trading away Stephon Gilmore from Dallas, 176. Offensive center or guard, Jarrett Patterson. Round seven, running back, Evan Hole. And then round seven from Tampa Bay, Christian Aizen. Is that how you said it? Aizen? Yeah. Uh, yours sounded better than mine. Mm. Are we thinking how many trades for Ballard? You got to set the over-under at two, right? Two and a half? 16 trades and six drafts for him. So it's about almost two a draft. So, yeah, a little over two to a draft. So, obviously, I assume that the number of nine picks heading into the night will change a little bit here. Is nine a lot? Um, Maybe a little bit above average, but, I mean, what, are five of them in the last three rounds? Yeah. So, obviously, the premium amount of the draft capital isn't as abundant as you would like. Okay, Eddie, anything else before we get into Twitter questions? I do not believe so. All right, let's hop in there. Tyler's Twitter question is up first. With the recent rumor of C.J. Stroud's cognitive S2 test results being much, much 
lower than many of the other prospects, and now Will Levis odds shifting to be the second overall pick. Do you think the Colts uh, would pass on Stroud if he were available? I know that very notion makes Eddie cringe. Um, It makes me more than cringe. (laughs) But how much of the improvisation, adaptability, quick thinking can be coached in comparison to Anthony Richardson's accuracy issues? As always, appreciate you both. Keep up the great work. Um, Yeah, I think this is something that... um is really curious to monitor. Obviously, it's the biggest national play right now. Um, you know, we had Joel Erickson on earlier today, and I remember at the combine Joel asking Chris Ballard about the S two test, and Ballard really clammed up pretty quickly, kind of on Ballard like you know he's a pretty smooth operator. And uh, on Friday, Steichen was on with McAfee, and he said they don't really pay too much attention to those tests. Yeah, and, and so I, I'm a little torn on it. You know, why would Ballard kind of clam up? Well, yeah, we, we, I. Does that mean he does pay attention to it? Does that mean he doesn't? I, I don't I don't know. That was, was just a bit awkward. You know, if you look at Sykin's recent history, Jalen Hurts did not have an overwhelming I, I think he actually had kind of one of the lowish tests in the S two. Certainly not hinder Jalen Hurts too much at the NFL level. Nope. Um, but then I recall in twenty twenty, uh Steichen telling a story about the Justin Herbert draft of COVID, so everything pretty much over Zoom at that point. And they basically told Herbert some sort of concept or you know route tree or whatever early in their zoom interaction with them and you know asked herbert later on to come back and 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 recall it or show some memory or draw it up and and herbert did it you know kind of blew them away and that was maybe the separator of like this guy gets it so you know, you you can look at it one of <laughs> one of either of those ways, whatever path you go down. I'm not of this like you didn't test well, you stink at football. Yeah, I, I that's not me. I also think that you know processing is a huge huge deal. And you know, is this test a great indicator? Are we still in a small sample size? I, I could see the Colts believing to it. I could also see the Colts saying, no, we're just going to cater an offense specifically to that player, and it's not going to be the most overwhelming thing in the world so i'm a bit torn on it um i tend to think cj stroud being drafted after anthony richardson and will levis would be a mistake oh yeah and i know you are saying that financially but i'm saying that with my well with my head as well, well i'm saying it both ways here <laughs> you know it's you know hertz was low it wasn't dan marina low in the wonder lick like i mean blaine gabbard and greg mcelroy were super high it's just the, the big the big thing is that uh, last year it was Brock Purdy who had a high score, and then sure. he steps into the San Francisco system that you and I could probably I succeed in. Yeah, uh, yeah. You give me those guys around me, and we could maybe, you know, move move the ball five yards. So I would not pass on Stroud, but where there's smoke, there's typically fire. Granted, how much is it line season? How much is it a team trying to push him down? Wake Spike shares uh, shares like equal sentiments that you made right out the start of the gate of the pod it's finally here thursday can't come soon enough for me to see who we pick and my wife to see the draft fashion show (laughs) that's always the one of the like underlying stories i like to sure monitor is like who knows how to dress like do you go extravagant or do you just kind of go casual obviously the green room can offer a couple looks if you know what i'm saying yep I also personally look forward to Kevin's late Thursday night podcast. I've been up for hours, quick pod. How many five-hour energies or coffees are you on by that point? You know, it's funny. I I will certainly have a second coffee on Thursday. Um, Last year, I we didn't. I don't think we did a late night one, right? Because I mean, they they just never picked. I wasn't around yet. Okay, yeah, I don't think so we that did one last still been year. CP. I do remember Joey and I doing one at the pod at the complex. I think that would have been twenty twenty. Would that have been all in Zoom? One year where they traded out. I know we did one. That would have been twenty twenty because yeah. of uh Would we have been at the complex? No, there's no way. They weren't even at the complex. Um I I remember Joey and I being in that side room there doing it one year. Nineteen? Yeah, maybe it was nineteen. When they traded Buck? Four buck or no? Yeah, but they had done that during the combine. Yeah. What do you think? Um, and then how many picks do you think Chris Ballard will have to see new Colts? Oh, okay. So we said nine. Boy, you got, got to set the under at nine and a half or ten and a half. Yeah, I'd say when it's all said and done, probably. 
Probably 10-ish, maybe 11. Let's go with 11. He, he acted like the fourth and fifth round. There are some starting quality guys there. So you think they're trading up from I could behind? Trading, I could see trading from 35 to like 40-something. Again, not necessarily my cup of tea, but I could see that happening there. Should we do one 10 a.m. Eddie Friday? A pod? Sounds good to me. Okay. Probably all depends on... We'll do an abbreviated one Friday morning, then we'll come back. Let's do a week. Let's do this exact time on Monday. Yeah, sounds good to me. Full, full recap. Nice little show meeting right there. There we go. Easy. Uh, Rodney says, if Shaq Leonard is damaged goods and will never play again, two questions. Will Jim Irsay pay him the entire contract like he did with Andrew Luck? And would that scenario make them even more likely to either trade back for extra picks or or take a Will Anderson type of player at four. They need impactful defenders. Thanks, Kevin and Eddie. Y'all rock. Thank you, Rodney. I appreciate that. I I mean, it's a good question. I, I, I guess he will, but no idea. I mean, the Shaq contract is just brutal for the next couple of years. So oh, yeah. No one is going to want that. Um, and, you know, by all accounts, Leonard's certainly going to try and give it a go this year, and we'll, we'll see exactly how he would – Look at things with that. If quarterbacks went one, two, three, Eddie, and let's say it's Levis or Richardson left at four, would you think at all about Richardson? Or excuse me, about um, Anderson? It's Levis and Anderson left at four. Would you think at all about Will Anderson? Oh, I hate you for this. If it's me, and I'm sure Ballard would have this mind come across his mind too, trade back. If there's a team that absolutely wants Anderson. That's just frightening to me. To me, you go 4-12-1 and one for a reason. You go 4-12-1 and one to get a generational player at a generational position. But with that said, I'm taking Will Anderson. Yeah, I, I, I don't agree with it, but at the same time, you're probably going to get a pretty good football player at a position that really matters, so you can't like totally, totally diminish it. Um, Gosh, the Colts just need, you know, out, out of out of Ryman, out of Pay, out of Pittman and Pierce. Boy, you, you just got to have someone ascend. You got to have okay. Who's going to become the Pro Bowler? Yeah, out of that group because those are the positions that matter. I mean, who's going to really take that jump here? Just a big, big storyline, not named quarterback. Yeah, I agree with you. And I mean, we've kind of hinted at it and said it a couple times, like. If Bally is sitting there at four and the quarterback he doesn't have the highest grade on is on the board, and you see Will Anderson, I mean, you would almost think he's inclined to take him because, A, it's a need. B, he's gushed about it being a really, really deep edge group. Uh, and this guy is probably a shoe in for 10 sacks for the majority of his career, barring injury. Would Devil's Advocate say it's a deep edge group? You don't need to take him. You can get an edge somewhere else. But if he's, if, but if it's a, deep edge class and he's at the top of it all it's a good point and that typically hints at that he's the most special out of that list of players that you have that you want to target for that group good point Craig's Twitter question is next. Hey, Kevin, question for the pod. Uh, would you rather stay put at four in either draft, Anthony Richardson or Will Levis, or trade back and get a falling Jalen Carter or Tyree Wilson and Hendon Hooker late in the first round? Uh, the Hooker being late in the first round. This assumes the Colts move back to 9-12 pick range and get enough compensation to move into the late first as well. If Ballard knows he might have a chance at Hooker, would he do a slight trade back and then pick up a top tier defender? Seems compelling. Boy, Jalen Carter and Tyree Wilson really dropping that far. You know? Right around 10-ish. And if uh, they went the Jalen Carter route, what would that say about the future of either Buckner yeah. or Big Grove? That's a, that, that's a great point. I mean, I, I understand the thinking. I think it's a tad wishful. On this front, uh, with that, um, you could also say it's, it was wishful think, thinking of me two weeks ago that Stroud <laughs> could still be there for the Colts. And now look, it's just, I mean, waking up today and seeing Levis at minus one thirty to go number two, it makes no sense. So who's the team? Is it Houston? I don't know. Is it the Colts trading up from four to two? Because they love Levis. Surely they won't. Houston would trade with Indianapolis. Surely they wouldn't. 
Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I, uh, God, we just got to get to Thursday night, man. We just got to get there. Where's the, where's the click remote? You fast forward, you know? Seriously, man. Patrick says, Chris Ballard needs to win now. If you're a GM on the hot seat, would you seriously take a quarterback who you may never see take a snap for your club? How likely is it that they draft the best defensive player available or trade this pick and acquire Lamar after the draft, giving up 20-something pick next year and getting a day one quarterback while bolstering your defense? This is a Richardson comment. Um, my guess is they stay there. And they and they um, and they take it. Um, I, I I think that Chris Ballard is going to have a ex- acceptable leash. Maybe isn't the right phrase. Extended. I think Jim Mercer is going to view it and like I'm going to wait till the guy at least gets into the gets into playing action before. Yeah. I fire the guy. Yeah. Um, again, this gets back to the earlier question of just. To me, Richardson needs so many game reps. I, I understand you want to, you know, you want to mold him a little bit and get him behind the scenes and learn from Minshew, et cetera. But at some point, you've got to throw him in there. I mean, I I'll never forget. I know it was much later in the draft, but when Jacob Eason was drafted, I think he was twelfth out of the thirteen quarterbacks chosen that year in college playing time. And it's like, you've got to play these guys. Yeah. You just never know. Now, again, Mahomes sat for a full year, and it worked. But to me, you've got to get some of these guys into the fire to learn, see what it's all about. And I don't think Kansas City at the time when they drafted Mahomes, he would turn into what they sure. have now. And Alex now. Smith was still the guy, right? Yeah. seventeen. So it's like they weren't actively sure. in a situation where they needed one to where sure. fans were like, start him now. Sure. I think that's where the Colts are at, though. Yeah, I um, that angle to the rest of the off season. When you go there, how you do it? Do you wait a whole year? You know, does your bye week fall in the middle of the season to where it makes sense during the bye week? You know, to throw the rookie in there because you do want to speed it up to a degree. And, and and again, you know, Mahomes sits, Peyton doesn't. Like you're gonna you're gonna find examples on both sides of it. Michael's Twitter question is up next. We've got one more after this. Shane Steichen and Chris Ballard have preached they want an accurate quarterback that can deliver the ball. There wasn't a more smooth and accurate quarterback than Stroud at the Combine. On the other side, Ballard has historically drafted players based off of their traits like Richardson and Levis. What do you think the Colts will lean toward come draft time? That's a great point. Um, This has always been something that, even dating back to the fall, Eddie, I debated internally. We know Ballard's infatuated with traits. I don't think the them. quarterback position is one where you get infatuated right. with traits and be like, oh, this guy has all the traits in the world and the physical makeup to be a successful quarterback, but does he have the the ability to process and read yeah. defenses and all that kind of stuff? I That's the, the more important part to me. I think it's a great point. Like The quarterback traits are different. It's less about what you do in the final week of February at the Combine yeah, versus what you can do more behind the scenes, more cognitively yeah, um, to that point. Um, sure, it, when you're blessed with great physical attributes, that helps, but it doesn't mean as much there as it means at some other spots. You know, if you, if you want to get into this S2 wonderlick rabbit hole, you can go find great football players that tested very poorly at other positions. Yeah. Wonderlick as... Wonderlick wise. So it just doesn't matter as much at some of those other spots on that. Um, so I think that is something that is a really great point. And it's been hard for me to pin down with Ballard. But what have him and Shane Steichen said all the time? I mean, on the field, certainly there's an accuracy element, but also how are you wired? Yep. How are you wired? And Stroud, I mean, Stroud isn't a guy that's like, who makes flashy plays. He's just a guy that does everything right in yeah. terms of delivering the football. And, like, he makes boring fun. He makes boring fun. And, again, the debate there is how easy it was for him at Ohio State, how much did he make it easy, and how much it was just superior talent week in and week out. And he didn't have to deal with a whole lot. Granted, 
his argument would say, you want to sit down and watch a Georgia game with me? To those people who try and discredit Stroud because of the players that he played with just frustrate me because when you get to the NFL, a lot of that success comes from coaching and not the talent. But the talent does outweigh a little bit because now you have all the coaching and all these scouts and everything that know the tendencies of teams and know where the exploits are. And it's a lot A lot of the NFL most of the time is matchups. It's like, how do you match up against a particular team? And I think there are games that you see from Stroud where he didn't have it and he still was able to exploit the matchup that was the weakest and find, find wins. To me, that's the biggest part um, going forward. That's a good point. You said I've got one more? Yep. Tyler, hey, Kevin, I've got a question for the podcast regarding Lamar Jackson. I've done some research on the non-exclusive tag, and it does not – put a deadline on a deal being done other than the 10th week of the regular season. So in theory, if a deal is struck post-draft, a team owes its next first round selections. So in theory, you can keep four plus sign Lamar. So as that's the case, does that change your thoughts about what you're doing with the fourth overall pick? You know, I'm glad Tyler mentioned this. I mean, this is part of the Lamar Jackson drama that we probably should just monitor a little bit this week. Um, it's a very Ravens colory thermal that you have. There. I got it for free, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> looks it looks great. It looks like a insulation through the roof there. Um, again, for Lamar, it's style and injuries for me. It's style and injuries for me more than anything. You look back December and January, the Ravens have played, I think, 12 games in those two months, the last two seasons, and Lamar's missed 10 straight. Um yeah, I think it's just fresh in our mind, Eddie, and this market. We tend to look at this player more. But I'm sure a lot of people saw the Victor Oladipo injury from over the weekend. Just awful. Um, left knee, patella tendon, the opposite knee from the one he hurt here back in whatever that was, 2018, 2019. And I think Oladipo's style is comparable a bit to a Lamar Jackson. Yeah. Victor Oladipo is a 6'4", streaky shooting guard. Those are very rare in the NBA. 6-4 is rare. Streaky is rare. What Victor needs to have with him at all times to be an all-star caliber player is he needs to be Russell Westbrook athletic. It's amazing how Westbrook has maintained his athleticism throughout his career. Old Depot, just physically, just gave out. But he had to attack the best basket just almost recklessly at times to try and be that type of player. At some point, that gives out. And it's given out for Victor. So at some point, can you become a 38% three-point shooter consistently? Can you be Buddy Heald? Buddy Heald is great staying power because his skill set, he can keep on doing into his 30s. Shoot the ball. Oladipo cannot. Yeah. And that's what I get out with Lamar and those sorts of quarterbacks. At some point, you can't continue to be the guy you were at 22. At some point, you have to deliver from the pocket. That is a Chris Bauer phrase he has said quite often, which might totally debunk an Anthony Richardson <laughs> selection. So that's the question that you have with him. Now, the Richardson caveat would be his size can make up for it. He's built like a tight end or a DN. He can withstand more of that than maybe as a little bit of a slender guy and Lamar Jackson compared to Anthony Richardson. I agree with you there. Eddie, the fourth pick will be who for the Colts? As much as I want it to be C.J. Stroud, it'll be Will Levis. You go and Levis? All right. I'll give the slight edge to Richardson. If it is Stroud, you might want to check on my well-being. <laughs> well, I think you and a lot of Colts fans, maybe you more than others with the financial commitment. All right, let's come back Friday morning, all right? Uh, Sounds we'll good have, to me. We'll have content up all week long, all through the draft as well, 1075thefan.com. Everybody enjoy draft week. Hallelujah. It is here.